Welcome to the Michigan Bros Grow Show podcast, episode number 33. Today's guest will be Rachel from Deep Roots Tissue Culture. Welcome, Rachel. Hi. Nice to be here. Welcome. Uh, Rachel comes to us uh, through her work with Deep Roots Tissue Culture, and we know them from working with Freedom Green Farms up in Kalkaska. One of our panelists, Tara, was able to work with you, and she speaks so glowingly of you that we couldn't wait to get you on here to do an interview. Aw, thanks. That's so kind. Tara was really wonderful to work with, and she also speaks highly of you guys in this show and the topics you cover. <clears throat> so really let's nice. start simply with uh, what is tissue culture? What does that mean to someone as a home grower? Um, so tissue culture is just any time that we take what is defined as tissue, which is an organized group of cells, and we grow it in a sterile environment. So this could be, you know, animal tissue, but what we're doing is we're tissuing plant, culturing plant tissue. So um, we're taking just any part of the plant and growing it inside of a sterile vessel. So it could be the leaves, it could be the stem, you know, like typically plant culture can use any part of, of the plant to generate new tissues. That's fascinating. Um, it's the apical meristem is what they're typically trying to use for that, or does it matter? Um, there's a couple different types of plant tissue culture that people do. One of them is called node culture, and then you also have apical meristem culture. Um, in between, people kind of do something that's more of like a uh, micro propagation of shoot tips, and that... Um, is what people would sometimes would like call meristem culture, but like there's a whole bud there. It's really big. You can see it. If you're doing a typical apical meristem culture, you have like a pile of 50 cells. It's very small. It's like the size of a grain of pepper at the end of your scalpel. So, wow. and then no culture is <clears throat> where we take just kind of on a normal stem and we sterilize it. And where a plant, where a leaf grows out in that apex are there, there's also a growing bud. And so we'll take that axillary bud um, and culture a whole plant out of that. And what's the timetable when you take something really, really small? Is that like a year? Is that six months? Yeah. So meristem culture can take upwards of a year because yeah, you're starting from, you know, a really tiny pile of cells and they're undifferentiated, just like, um, stem cells in us. And so, you know, we can get them to become roots and then, you know, shoots and different organized tissues. Um, but when we do node culture, it's generally a lot faster. So it's more like two to three months from your plants going into coming out. And node culture um, won't cure hoplite and viroid, but it is um, a nice fix for either maintaining sterile genetic material or, um, you know, your plants aren't infected now. And I've had clients of mine who, you know, did the, our tissue culture process. And in the time that they gave their plants to us before they got them back, their gardens were hit with hoplite and viroid. So it was just nice for them to have like backups of the genetics they already had. So they didn't have to try to remediate anything. Um, so node culture is good for that. And also node culture helps clean up different surface pathogens. So if you're struggling with like powdery mildew or something like that, you can just kind of clean up your garden really fast with node culture and start over and the problem's just gone, you know? And then again, you have your cultures established so you can always go back to them. Are you adding something to the culture when you take it to eliminate things like uh, powdery mildew or things like that? No. So the way powdery mildew grows is the spore really infects a localized area on the leaf. And so even if you you know use a surface treatment and you're cleaning off what we see on the top of the leaf, which is the spore bearing um, part of the fungal organism, there's still usually a portion that's inside that leaf. And that's still going to be able to give rise to new spore bearing um, structures that end up still contaminating your garden. So these organisms can only live really in leaves and other types of tissue like that. So when we um, take in for node culture, we're cutting off all of that tissue, all of those extra leaves, and really going down to what people should be going down to if they're doing it properly is, you know, a very compact bud in that plant axle. And at that point, there shouldn't be any powdery mildew or diseases on it. And we've, you know, removed all that tissue. So that's Did that incredible. answer your question? <laughs> yeah. The, 
the node tissue culture sounds a lot like a very enhanced version of like cloning, like a, you know, next level cloning to clean your plants up a little bit. And, uh, you know, it's much faster than the, uh, than the other version when you're down to the very cellular level. Um, I could definitely see benefits there when people are doing uh, tissue culture for storage, um, like the more long-term version, are they, are they going more down to the, uh, the 50 cell level? Um, I mean, sometimes people just want to put back their stuff really quickly, you know, and just have it backed up. And a lot of people just do node culture for that. Mm -hmm. You know, there is some culture, it takes a long time. And, and a lot of people don't want to pay for it unless they're trying to remediate hoplite and viroid from a very precious strain of theirs. Um, I do think we'll see a lot of people just getting genetic um, genetics from plants that have been meristem cultured because, you know, even, you know, okay, haplate and viroid is something that we definitely don't want and we want to make sure our plants don't have that. But there's all kinds of other viroids and viruses that we may not even understand are affecting our plants at this point yet. Sure. So it's nice it's, just to have clean stock. It's yeah, but nice right. to have a way to fight back against that stuff. I mean, a, a few years ago when we started hearing about hoplite and viroid and stuff it's like oh man this is the death blow to cultivating you know it's just such a pain in the ass and having those backed up at the same time as well so i mean just because i have no issues today doesn't mean that i won't next week so yeah yeah and it is kind of you know like you said like um enhanced cloning almost you know because you are, um, you know, you are able to multiply the plants and node culture is something that's more, in my opinion, um, approachable for, you know, everyday growers. You know, I don't think it's that complicated of a technique. You know, you need some equipment, but not a ton. Like you saw Athena recently released, uh, you know, a tissue culture kit kind of, you know, and really essentially they put what you need in there, you know, a pressure cooker and a sterile, you know, a sterile environment. You need to be able to create a sterile environment, you know, and, and have good technique. You know, you need a really good teacher and you need to have good technique, but like anybody who has like a decent genetic library could reasonably back up what they have, you know, themselves. How, sure. cool, how long could you hold something uh, in that status, like in perpetuity or would we have to grow it out eventually and then reset it? Um, I like to grow things out and reset them, but I also keep things in culture for a long time. You know, you can keep multiplying it out. Some things after a while, they just kind of keep wanting to root. But if you keep culturing off of the top of something that's rooting, you know, you have unrooted material and you can keep subculturing. Um, we have ways of storing the material, the different genetic material, so that we don't have to keep subculturing as quickly. Um, it's like more of a storage kind of method but we also um i don't i i teach people synthetic seeds but i don't really believe in them as a long-term genetic storage method so synthetic seeds that sounds that cool. was the word i was was focusing in on can you talk a little bit more about that um yeah so in theory uh like i was talking about with the node culture we take a small bud out of the plant axle and we grow a whole plant from this like tiny little bud that was in the plant axle um, so when we do synthetic seeds, um, we're basically trying to encapsulate that portion of the plant in a tiny little agarose bead. Um, agar or agarose is that gelling agent that you see in like petri dishes or okay. in plant tissue culture. It's like what makes My it solid. Know. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, so you encapsulate that little bud and then you're able to kind of store it in the cold and be able to bring it back out. Um, I just the from my own trials my materials never lasted really well in cold storage it tends to kind of get brown and and i just with the what i've read as revival rates and what i've seen as revival rates i'd be really scared that i might lose something if i stored something that way so it's it's really cool but i mean i guess it just needs maybe if it was um tweaked a little bit like if somebody really did some work and optimized it and like this is the temperature this is the you know media that we use everything is works great and there's like above a 60 percent guaranteed you know reciprocation rate that would be ideal but you know sometimes it's like as low as 30 percent and it's just like oh that's dangerously close to fail <laughs> you know sure. if you're doing like you know 10 or 20 that's real close to like missing mm -hmm. the boat uh, so my question for you is, you said in your experience, how long have you been doing this? Um, I've been doing cannabis tissue culture since, uh, 
2020, 2019. Um, but I did tissue culture um, in a plant lab back when I was in school in my undergrad. Um, I did three years in a plant lab there where I genetically engineered tobacco and um, grew up new plants. We were I was staunchly against genetically engineering then, but um, we were working on a project that would have changed the way that stomata, um, the guard cells around stomata behaved so that plants were losing less water. And that was really appealing to me because, you know, a lot of the natural water resources that we have are hugely diverted for agriculture. And so I thought like, well, maybe we could like preserve some of these natural resources, you know, but um, so we did it. It was kind of cool. You know, I got to follow the whole project through and, you know, measure the gas exchange. And unfortunately, it didn't yield much, but it was really exciting and really cool. So um, I stayed in medical research. I worked in research for a while. Um, I was kind of like slated to go do a Ph.D. And I just saw a lot of people in that um, that had done that in different settings, you know, whether they were, you know, academic professors or working in research. And I just didn't see any of those as being something that would like satisfy me, you know, like it just, some of them, there's just not a lot of gratitude. Some of them, they just, you work like a ton. Some of them, you just end up in doing a project that you have no passion for, you know, or, you know, if I went into plant biology, which is where I was headed, I could have potentially worked for like Monsanto or somebody, you know, and that was a huge turnoff for me because, you know, they're putting small farmers out of business left and right, you know, not just with their business ethics. I mean, like with like underhanded like legal stuff, you know, and, and I couldn't, I couldn't do that like conscientiously. So, um, I kind of just kind of kept biding my time at U of M doing research. You know, I had some cool projects that I worked on and it was really fun to be there. And then, um, one of my friends who worked at a grow store and had three grows of his own was like, you know, you should, you should do this plant tissue culture for cannabis. And I was kind of like, you're crazy. What are you talking about? You know, nobody wants genetically engineered cannabis. Oh, and man. But think about how many people are grateful that come to you with their cannabis reclamation projects versus someone that comes to you with sugar snap pea reclamation. You know, like, hey, people are a lot yeah. more like, oh, my God, you're my savior. Thank you so much. Well, and it's fun, you know, and honestly, like the people that I've worked with, you know, like Drew over at Freedom Green Farms you know, and Tara, like these people are really excited about it and they're passionate about the plant and they're passionate about what they do. They work super hard and they're always trying to level up. And the one thing I always hear from people is, you know, this is the most I've leveled up since, and like the, since I can remember, you know, in like three or four years, you know, there's been nothing new to my skill set that's made me feel like I'm, you know, really stepping somewhere new. And so that's really fun to hear. You know, I, I, did a lot of tutoring for high school math and science. And so like, it's, it's really fun for me to see people like really enjoy science and like be able to like apply it to what they're doing, you know, cause so much of like what you learn is like, Oh, well, you'll never use it, but you have to learn it anyways. You know? Go ahead. Sequence. Oh, I was just going to make a little quip about how that's something <laughs> I battle with all the time with, you know, <laughs> I've got kids, so. I, you know, I tell the kids it's better you, even if you don't use that for like, you know, something that you do, it's better to know it. Cause then nobody can use it against you. You know what Maybe I mean? Like nobody can point. pull one sure. over you. Sure. Uh, I've learned more about science in the last 11 years growing cannabis than I did in all of my years of schooling, but it's because I have a vested interest in it now. And so, you know, for me to see where it's changed and how many leaps and bounds there have been towards progress with cannabis in just this short amount of time. It's mind blowing to think of where it'll be in another five years or 10 years. Yeah, and I think a lot of people, you know, like you're saying you learn more about science in the last 11 years. And I mean, yeah, I think, you know, cause you, it, it's super relevant to you, but I think it's also because it's applicable. And I think a lot of people that grow cannabis you know, we're people that learn with our hands and by doing things, you know, and that's how we remember things and learn and by acting in the real world, not like reading books. And so I think that's when like science really becomes fun because it becomes a critical part of what you're doing, you know, and you have to understand it. And it all of a sudden you're like, oh, this knowledge is actually kind of cool because I'm using it, you know, to benefit my environment. <clears throat> So as, as I understand it right now, tissue culture is still kind of expensive, but um, obviously you said there's some companies working on like home kits and that sort of thing. What sort of scale 
does like a grower have to be at before it's feasible to start kind of considering these sorts of things? Like what's kind of an entry level cost if you needed to have a strain cleaned up, so to speak? Um, like if you were just getting node culture, um, it ranges anywhere from, you know, usually like one to $2,000 for just like one cultivar for node culture. Um, most places will cut you deals, you know, if you do more, it just depends on, you know, where you're going. Um, Meristem culture is something that if you're going to have done, you want to really research the people that are doing it for you um, because everyone will charge you the same amount, but you won't get the same product back from everyone, sure. you know, and everyone doesn't do the same job, you know, but it is really tedious because you're doing micro dissections, you know, on plant material and you're trying to keep everything super sterile, you know, the whole time. So, so yeah, I mean, there's definitely a range there. And I think that goes like from like 2,500 up to like 8,000. I think Segra in Canada charges like 8,000 for that, but they also have, you know, really good protocols, really good scientists and really good, you know, the, the rates of them getting stuff back to you is, you know, really high, like 70 to 80%, you know? So it's, it, it can, but for now for a personal grower, like if you just wanted to do this, I mean, it's basically the same, you know, along the same skill set as cultivating mushrooms, you know? And now with like the psychedelic um, revival, I don't know if I'm allowed to kind of say, is it yeah, okay? Yeah. yeah that's but a lot of people, you know, yeah. grow mushrooms at home and it's like, easy, it's relatively easy. You know, you just, you have the pressure cooker, you know, you have a sterile environment and it's a range, you know, like some people work inside a sterile tub and I don't recommend that for plant tissue culture because like everything grows faster than plants, fungus, you know, bacteria, you know, all the things. But, you know, if you can set up a sterile, you know, flow area, it's not out of someone's reach, you know, um, and you can, you know, make your own box and put a filter on it or you know you can buy a really nice filter from you know a nice laminar flow hood from a company there's a whole range of what you can you sure. know get and do with that the uh the agar or whatever you would use like agar, in the, yeah yeah, in yeah. The dishes itself is that a special blend used for tissue culture i know that you're trying to deliver the plants basic nutrients right and uh, all yeah. the building blocks they need is that yeah. like a certain blend you've got to use for cannabis versus other things <clears throat> um there's some really common um mixes out there that a lot of people do use in cannabis um some people have like additions that they might add to them you know different modifications where maybe they alter some of the nutrients um but the one that most tissue culture people would start out with would, would, would be either ms media or dkw media and those are both really common in, in plant tissue culture period, but also in cannabis, that DKW is really popular too. Um, and they all stand like in botany, everybody that has ever done anything like needs their name on it. And so everything in botany is like some series of like weird old guys names. <laughs> so, so it's like a lot of abbreviations. <laughs> everything I do for work is, is an abbreviation as well, but it's nice to have the information there. Someone can look that up on a search engine and they, they can find the information they're looking for. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then there's like various um, plant growth regulators people use, you know, and there's um, sucrose and agar and you can use a range for that too. You know, some people use, you know, molecular biograde sucrose for their tissue culture. And some people will get a bag of pioneer sugar from the grocery store and say that they have the same exact, you know, results. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's a range, you know, I mean, I work in a lab, you know, I have a lab, so I, stick to the tissue culture grade sucrose because I'm trying to keep everything consistent, but you know, I'm sure, sure pioneer sugar works great too. Honestly. I would be uh, taken aback if I walked into a lab and I seen a whole pallet of that, I'd be like, what are we doing here guys? <laughs> right. Making cookies, you know, how often does someone get a hold of you and ask you to help them pop seeds? Um, I've only had one person ask me to pop seeds. And to be honest, I've put that project a little bit on my back burner because I'm nervous about losing the seeds. Um, that embryo dissection, um, I see, I don't see people having like super great results with it. 
And I have never had super great results myself. And so um, I wanted to try a couple things before I started this person's project. And in all honesty, he gave it to me like way too long ago, maybe six or seven yeah. months ago. We've had a really busy year um, between all the testing and tissue culture and everything. Um, but yeah. <laughs> I think most growers have like some seed that they can't pop. It's a mythical pack of seeds they got from like their uncle that came back from Something. NAM or yeah, whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, for us, it's zero percent. So like if you can get 10 percent of them, then whoever will be really happy. But if you can yeah. get a viable female plant, yeah. we're happy. Get a plant. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that is um, definitely a technique that people do is that embryo rescue where they kind of crack open seeds and dissect out the embryo and grow it. Um, up it is water. fascinating right there. That's like, yeah. I mean, if you have a microscope, you can do, you know, or a dissecting microscope, you can do a lot of this and they're not super expensive. Again, there's a range, you know, and you can get a low end one for probably less than $200, you know? Oh, wow. You know, this doesn't seem too bad. You know, you talk about a pressure cooker. We're trying to keep things as clean and sterile as we possibly can. We're trying to work with the freshest material. And it's all about trying to shoot for that mythical 100% success rate. Well, and that's why I wanted to bring up cost, you know, because she said she's been in the game since 2019. I'm sure that cost has come down consistently up till yeah. now. And um, people are going to be curious and uh, wanting to get into doing this. and. That's why they're watching the episode. So uh, very, very re relevant for them, for sure. Yeah, I mean, it's there's just, you know, once you kind of learn what you're doing and sterile technique, I it's, you know, it's just a laboratory skill. And people do this in labs all the time. You know, I mean, there's definitely people that seem to catch on faster, just like in the garden. You know, there's people that just like really, once you kind of give them the, the flow through, they're great with it. And other people, you know, it just takes them a couple more tries, you know, but I mean, I think really people who are super motivated and just on that, like that path of, I want to learn as much as I can and have the best garden possible and stay on the edge. It, those people just seem to like really accelerate through these classes. Grower's going to grow. You know what I mean? And it's not just plants. Hopefully it's you as well and, and learn how best to try to set these plants up to succeed for us. You know, a lot of, we talk a lot about environment and half the other time we talk about genetics. But the third component to that is practices and protocols and how we do things. And I think that's where we as the cannabis community can really start to take pages out of the scientific community's books and start to try to use those practices and incorporate those into our SOPs. Yeah, I agree. Um, I actually worked with someone at U of M who a while back, he worked for a different protein analytical company and then he started his own company and he basically just writes SOPs for um, large scale facilities, you know, because it's such an important thing to make sure that that everyone in the facility is following the exact same protocol. And you're right. I think, you know, I mean, and, and as it goes, as cannabis transfers, you know, more from something that was like at one time completely illegal everywhere, you know, to now it's completely, you know, well, at least on a state level, legal every, you know, in a lot of places, you know, you will see it being in more, you know, more scientific research done on this and it more being more approachable for people. And it, instead of being this like basement thing that people do, however they can, it will be kind of in that agricultural scale where people treat it like other agricultural commodities, you know, and at this point, a lot of those other agricultural commodities do come from tissue culture because disease is so rampant in different, you know, products especially like blueberries and things like that well with the relaxation on the cannabis bugaboo it's also made it so that more universities are able to actually go after and look into and have funding mm -hmm. to do research into cannabis and i think as we get the younger generation of thinkers on this we're going to be able to avoid a lot of the dogma that comes along with you know especially in the cannabis community, we've, we've carried a lot of things as dogma forward with us for years and years and years that, you know, now as we see, they don't really bear fruit. So. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, in a lot of places, I think that stigma is totally gone. And in some places it's still weirdly there, you know, um, I don't know. I don't, I don't understand how it's still there, but um, I definitely still see it like, you know, and again, I came from you know, a really big research institution and a lot of different types of people, you know, and some people just, there's no beneficial thing at all. And then, you know, and then you see people, you know, who 
go from having 200 seizures a day to none. And it's like, how can you say that? That there's no benefit, you know, in good conscience. How can you say that? So yeah, it sounds rather unscientific and dogmatic to me. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? Yeah. Which is, yeah, interesting. Is <laughs> from people who are supposed to be, you know, accepting knowledge. It, I don't know. I guess that's the idealistic. We're getting there. Research. We're, we're following <laughs> follow the research, guys. That's all we're, we're going to say. There. Um, but yeah, no, so you talked a little bit about genetics and I think it's important too, because another thing that um, node culture tries to accomplish or that at least is shown in the literature is that, you know, over time we see our moms getting tired and wore out the rooting times, you know, increase and the vigor, you know, just maybe decreases a little bit. Maybe our yield decreases a little bit over time. And, you know, we say like, oh, this mom's just getting old and tired. You know, you've kept her around for 15 years now, 10 years because you can and um, one thing that happens with plants is, you know, they can't move, they can't change their environment. And so all they can do is change how they react to it. And so plants tend to make a lot of epigenetic changes, which are modifications above the DNA level and how they respond to the environment. You know, what they're, what they're going to send in terms of their RNA and making proteins for their, for whatever's happening, whatever stress, whatever good, whatever bad. And when we put plants through tissue culture, we do see, um, a change in that epigenetic um, sequence and so, or that epigenetic profile. And so one of the things that we um, think that we're accomplishing, you know, in tissue culture based on, you know, my own results, but also, you know, the testimony of others is we see a lot of plants that were tired, you know, have now increased vigor when they come out of tissue culture, you know, their rooting times are, you know, way down, you know, and they're doing great, growing faster, super vigorous. And so that is another benefit, you know, in addition to potentially scrubbing any surface pathogens. I was wondering if there were pathogens or, or unknown viroids that are in there that we've held there for so long that we're just like, well, you know, it used to be like an orange strain and now it's turned into more of a spicy strain. And, and you know, to your point, those are those epigenetic changes that we're seeing enacted in our own gardens. Yeah, yeah. definitely. There's, there's classic cuts where they'll be like, well, if you don't have the one that's all variegated and looks like it has hop latent, you don't have the real one. That's kind of how they track the bumpy one. It's like that's the worst, you know, that's what we're trying to get rid of. But. Yeah. I think too, um, as people do a lot more genetic sequencing, we'll see kind of um, more truth in strains, you know, like understanding what strains are. But I mean, like back in the day, you know, you'd go to Amsterdam and you'd get a packet of seeds and you'd pop like um, 10 Sensi star seeds and you'd have 10 cents star plants, you know, and nobody really understood. I mean, at least then it wasn't right. like widely talked about like what a pheno hunt was or like that each one of those plants was genetically different. And so if you kept one plant and you gave your buddy one plant, you don't have the same plant. You know what I mean? And so I think right. that's where a lot of that like confusion in terms of like what we're calling something is. And I think that's where you see a lot more of like, this is so-and-so's cut of this plant or so-and-so's hunt of that plant. Speaking to Amsterdam, one of the things that they ran into, or you would think that they would run into, um, would be bottlenecking. You know, we talk about Northern Lights, and so, or Sensi Star, and if you have a 10-pack of those, you, it makes me wonder, you know, at what point in the filial generation are they? Are these like F5s, F6s, F7s, or something? Because people didn't really, you know, promote that sort of thing back, you know, 15, 20 years ago. So yeah. now you wonder, okay, we have, I guess, I don't know if it's a proper term, but I'll call it like polygenetics, where we have multiple parentages on both sides and how we see that expressed uh, in the progeny seeds is, I don't know, there's just so many variables right now as it is that it's like, whew, man. Yeah. Are you um, speaking like the reversals where they'll get a, a female to pollinate? Um, no, I mean that it's like we have so many different plants that like, let's say that you have Girl Scout cookies on one side and Gorilla Glue on the other side. So there's like five different parents involved, even though there's yeah. really only two. So it's the yeah. the expression of those. And then as it relates to like, okay, so it wants to be this way. And now it's going to have an epigenetic shift after three years in my garden because, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm not a good grower and and the plant has been stressed out for the last 24 months. 
Yeah, you yeah. know, I'm just keeping it real. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, there's so many things that can affect that. And there's even, you know, other weird things that plants do. Plants like to move DNA around in ways that animals don't. And, you know, there's something called stomaclonal variation, which is like a whole nother kind of thing that a plant can do where part of it can end up being genetically different from the rest of it. It's, it, plants do really weird things, you know, so it's like, it's cool to learn about this. And it's really cool that it's kind of coming out there. And it's nice that it's different, you know, from other things. What pressures I mean, a plant to do that? Hmm? What pressures a plant to do that? Um, You know, I'm not really sure. Um, I think it's just maintaining genetic plasticity, you know, that flexibility to, to deal with all kinds of things, That's you know, wild. like um, <laughs> we see like um, polyploidy. So, you know, normally you have like, you know, the dad and the mom, and then you have two copies of genetics. But then for um, strains like MAC1, there's a triploid. So there's like a third set of genetics there. And this is something that um, a lot of times we'll do with flowers um, to get like really big bud sets on flowers. So there'll be extra petals and it'll be nice and showy. But for cannabis, I mean, this is why some of those um, that are have been shown to be triploids are really big producers is because this like genetic flexibility that plants have. You know, if, if you have a human that ha ends up having three copies of a chromosome, I mean, there's clearly either, you know, a spontaneous abortion or something, you know, a physical effect. It just doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. So it doesn't happen. It's not OK. Plants are like, sure. OK, sure. We'll take more. We'll, we'll just express more genes. Great. <laughs> <laughs> the more the merrier. <laughs> They're fascinating. The thing that really got me into growing in the first place was when I, the first time I saw someone cut a branch off of a plant mm -hmm. and put it in a cloner, and they were like, that plant's going to be that plant. That's a real clone, like yeah. Dolly the sheep. And I was like, oh. Yeah, one seed doesn't equal one plant. What? And here Wait, I am year, years on. later, like, wow, I can <laughs> just clone plants. This is the craziest thing. You can just walk through Home Depot and take a leaf here and a leaf there. Right. <laughs> Start my own, right? Well, you can. I can't do that. Butterfly bushes. You know. Yeah. <laughs> so what do you like to do the most, Rachel, as, as it relates to tissue culture? What portion of it is the most fascinating to you? Um, Honestly, like the research, you know, like I, I've, I, I have, always loved research, like doing something new. Whenever I've done something enough times, it just gets boring. So, you know, I like trying to figure out like, okay, if I, you know, mess around with some of these, you know, different concentrations of, you know, magnesium, you know, or whatever, like, how is that going to affect my plant? Or if I try different hormone levels, or if I even, you know, try different media compositions that maybe somebody else made up, you know, some modification of one that I already have. So that's fun. I like different um, rooting, you know, techniques, things like that. I really like meristem dissections a lot. Um, it's just kind of nice to like zone out behind a microscope. It's like really zen to just, you know, just sit there dissecting and, you know, so are, you, I, are you using like a regular old exacto knife and just or um, scalpels, scalpels like scalpels with um number they have very uh pointed blades so um you can kind of like easily get that little thing out but yeah just uh number 11 scalpel blades and i think they're number four scalpels what kind of magnification Incredible. are you working under um, I have a microscope or a dissecting scope. Um, I say microscope versus dissecting scope because one, you're kind of, um, you have like light illuminating through something and you're doing a higher magnification and you're much closer to what you're looking at. Um, a dissecting scope is going to give you more space there. And mine has a range of like 0.5 to 90, but realistically, if you got up to 60, you know, 50 or 60, you could see what you were doing just fine and, and get that there. But so, you need that range though, because you start out really big and then you get really small. And how long does that process uh, sometimes take for you to do? Um, the dissecting of each meristem? Yeah. Maybe like 15 minutes or so for each like one. Pretty quick then, okay. 20, maybe wow. 20. Okay. You know, once you get everything kind of like set up, you know, you can kind of get through them pretty quickly. Like you said, it's like, this is like that Zen thing where you're just kind of like, okay, we'll just, you know, Keep going here, 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 you know, and 
it's like, it's also, you know, something really challenging. And I find like doing things that are really challenging when I get them, they're really rewarding. <laughs> sure. Sure. That makes a lot of sense. It sounds like between the research and that, that it's going to be your dusty old name. That's going to end up in the books with some kind of process. Some sort of acronym. No, there's yeah, so, exactly. Come on, so much man. more money and resources for this kind of stuff. You know, like I'm really glad that some of the people out there that are, you know, profiting from this stuff are putting some of that money back into the research and helping to understand a little bit more, you know, especially for haploid and viroid um, about, you know, where it lives, the best ways to detect it. You know, it's, I've just, I've been in so many gardens, you know, I've had really close friends who have had their gardens just completely destroyed by this. And, you know, like we didn't know what it was for a long time. Now we know, and now we can test, but like, even now, you know, it was really shocking to me because even here in Michigan, like in the last year, there have been people that are can, like, don't know what haploid and viroid is. And I'm like, how do you not know what this is? Doesn't like, isn't this like, everybody knows what this is now, you know? It's the boogie, man. It's, it's the used spider to be the mites of thing, 2023 man. right now. Right. Yeah. Russet. <laughs> yeah, right. The next Russet might, Jesus. So, <laughs> I know so can we talk about thing. HLV for a little bit? And yeah, what, yeah, definitely. what the latest research says about it? Um, yeah, so the stuff that I've seen most recently is just basically, you know, anything updated is, you know, clean your tools, um, test, you know, if you have it in your garden, it's a good idea to test your plants, you know, at least your mom, mother stock, you know, every six to eight weeks, you know, and make sure if you've had it there, you know, until you get maybe two or three negative tests where nothing is positive. You know, and then maybe you can less frequently or spot test or something like that just to, as a preventative thing. You know, um, I kind of go on Chumi's recommendations a lot. They have a lot of seemingly good scientists that do good work to kind of further that information, you know, and they have the resources to put at that. So, you know, they've uh, done recent research that shows the root is the most um, likely to be Indu ind inductive of, ind of what that actual plant has. So um, if it is positive, the root is the most likely to tell you. Um, unfortunately, there's more PCR inhibitors in the root than any other tissue, <laughs> which makes it a little bit challenging. But, um, you know, we work around it. And again, that's part of the research is, you know, finding the best techniques to get those nucleic acids out of that tissue without, you know, bringing along all the PCR inhibitors with it. And, you know. But yeah, they do good research. Um, you know, like one other thing that I'd like to talk to you about HLVD is, you know, we always talk about it being our tools and that's super important. You know, you have to use your 10 to 20% bleach. Everybody should know that by now um, to put their tools into for at least a minute. You know, if there's like stuff, guck on it, you know, get it off, get it, you know, scrape it off your tools and then soak them. Um, but, you know, I've been in a lot of gardens that have this and they're, you know, really good on their protocols. You know, everyone's using clean scissors, everyone's using clean gloves, you know, and they're not transmitting it and they can't figure out how they keep getting it passed around. And without fail, every garden that has that problem also seems to at some point have had a problem with thrips or fungus gnats. And so I think even though it's not in the literature that these bugs are transmitting hoplite and viroid, and we haven't proven that, you know, in an academic, uh, reference situation yet i think that it's very likely that those are other transmission modes you know so, and so when people are poor like why is, does this keep coming or why i'm having this problem i think there's sometimes other vectors that we might not be paying attention to sure thrips like to vector everything else why not yeah. exactly stop overwatering. there we go there's our, there's our talk on thrips real quick stop it uh so I know you like you spoke on how much you enjoy research and I don't want you to give away any of your company's secrets or anything, but kind of what do you think is the the next big thing or the next important revelation that's going to happen as far as tissue culture goes? Um, you know, I don't I don't really know um, what it's you know, it's I feel like it's an old like an, an old generation thing, you know, like it's been around forever. People do it for orchids mm -hmm. and blueberries and all the things. We're just starting um, to use it now in our in our industry. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, there's you know, there's a way that we could take it, which is, you know, oh, we're gonna introduce all these genes maybe that are resistant for different things, but that involves genetic engineering and I mean, and to do that, you have to, you know, use marker genes. So we're using genes for pesticide resistance and spraying everything with glyphosate. And I mean, that's just something that yeah. I personally want to stay away from. Um, sure. So I like there's that direction and that's a little bit scary. Um, 
you know, I'd like to see just more information on like the different viroids. Um, you know, I was reading the other day on some little viroid that was affecting, God, I don't remember what the plant was, maybe carrots. And um, it just, it basically changed the size of their inflorescence. It just made the flowers a little tiny bit smaller. And the real world repercussions of that were the pollinators were having a hard time then pollinating these particular flowers. But it was like one of those things where I thought to myself, like, wow, if something like this infected cannabis, it would be one of those things where growers would be like hitting their heads on the wall, trying to figure out why their yields are like 10% less or 20% less, like, you know, and they're doing all the same stuff. And so mm -hmm. I think that um, it's just going to be kind of, again, keeping clean genetic stock. Um, maybe even having, you know, if you are a facility, having someone on your staff that does this or doing your own Maristem culture and just kind of keeping it around just as a backup, you know, I think you're going to also see people just getting everything from a clean tissue culture mother. And, you know, you, you take one plant out of tissue culture, you grow up a mother, you take all of your cuts off that you fill up your greenhouse, you get rid of that mom you take your next mom out of tissue culture and you have a brand new clean mom. And, you know, you're always starting with a clean zero and working your way through, you know, the system, which is super important is working, you know, clean to dirty. And I think the more we can do that, the better we mitigate our risks. I bet there's some companies already doing that. Yeah, I'm sure. Tissue culture. And then, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, we genetically bank and definitely, you know, offer the service of giving people, you know, their mother plants back or rooted plants back, you know, so many times a year to kind of like remom, you know. It's awesome. I'm so fascinated by all of it. I know my brain's like the gears are turning and I'm thinking and I'm thinking and I'm thinking and I'm trying to follow what she's saying and I'm thinking and I was like, wow, man. It's like five things in this that are new to me. So. That's it, huh? That's good. What um, would you it, say to our listeners right now that um, might be interested in going into this for themselves, either through education or as some kind of um, really serious hobby? Um, I would say it's like everything else in cannabis, and it's a ton of work. You know, if you're if you're willing to do that, that's great. If you think this is going to be something that like oh, I won't have to like spend the time taking care of my mothers anymore. So this will be great. Or I won't need to have that space or that like um, expense. Like it's not going to solve that problem for you, you know, because you're still going to have to subculture your plants. You're still going to have to check on everything. You're still going to have to either make media or buy media from somebody. You know, you're still going to have to keep all your tools, you know, re-sterilized for your, you know, it's still a lot of work. You know, I mean, like we kind of joke in the lab, like, you know, I went to college so that, you know, my mom said, go to college so you wouldn't have to wash dishes. And it's like washing dishes, you know, all <laughs> the glassware and, you know, magenta boxes and all the things. So. Sterile is very clean. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But it's a lot of dirty dishes. So, I mean, you know, you, you have, you're, you're not, it's not going to get rid of all of your work for you. But if you do have the goal of either backing up your own genetics or, um, you work for a facility where they work that into like their mother program or their, you know, nursery program, you know, there's a lot of benefits to those types of things, you know, and, and a lot of people come through these classes, you know, they just, they're growers with a lot of plants, you know, they have a whole, you know, warehouse full of just moms and they want to, they're either worried about hoplite and viroid or they want to back things up, you know, and, they're already doing all that work, you know? So these people obviously, you know, and those are the people that succeed, you know, and do the best or the people that aren't allergic to doing work and they know ex that it's going to be work and they just, you know, put their head down and do it. Yeah. I think yeah. everybody can get into it. Yeah. Can't be resistant to change. Yeah, no. Well, I like that you're saying that it's not a shortcut. Um, it's not a shortcut to work. There, There is a lot more work that you will have to do by taking this up but at the same time you also illustrated the benefits by being able to grow at something that we is a known clean thing and if we've you know dotted our i's and crossed our t's we've set up a proper environment and now we can grow out healthy plants that have the potential to give us 100 percent of the return that they have to offer it's it's fascinating and i i just think it's great going forward that um, i feel like we're on the cusp of something of, of like the the ability for us to be able to use cannabis as medicine because we better understand 
it not just as a plan and what it can do for us, but a plan as how we can help it grow and keep it as healthy as possible. And, you know, what you're doing for Deep Roots Tissue Culture, you know, you're helping a lot of people. And we haven't really even spoken about, you know, Deep Roots and what you guys offer or do for people and clients. Yeah. Um, so like I said, you know, I started kind of doing tissue culture and had a lot of success with that um, starting off. And so um, I sought out a couple other people doing it and bought recipes um, and started teaching classes. So I teach people how to do this. Um, I take clients on who want to clean up their genetic stock. Um, so I do the work for other people that don't either have the capacity, the time, the personnel to do it themselves. Um, we also do testing. So, um, when we started doing this, we realized haploid and thyroid was a really big problem in the industry. And that's what a lot of people were wanting to do. And, you know, when you're trying to make sure that you're remediating haploid and thyroid, one of the things you want to know is whether the plant has haploid and thyroid. So like immediately it was like, okay, well, we need to set up the, you know, facilities to be able to do that. And, um, uh, I ran into Ben from Michigan craft cannabis, who really was a super motivating to me to like getting all that ready. It was not easy to do, you know, as a single person trying to set all that up, you know, some of these companies have a lot of infrastructure and a lot of people working on these problems. And so for me, it was like, I need to be able to test all these plants, but I also, you know, need to figure out how to do all of this. So he was super um, cool and helping with that, but we do a lot of testing. Um, now we do not just hoplite and thyroid testing, but tobacco mosaic virus testing, um, beet curly top, which thankfully we haven't seen any of those yet um, from any of our folks here in Michigan that have submitted testing. We're outside of Michigan. Um, we do um, a lot of fungal testing. And right now we're kind of, we work with a couple gardens who have had some fungal issues. And we've noticed that um, some of our assays that we purchase from different um, cannabis as, you know, pathogen screening companies, they just don't seem to be very accurate and reliable. So we're currently working out different ways to be able to um, culture out different things that are growing in the plants and then sequencing that um, pieces of that organism to be able to match it to a known genetic sequence. So instead of like targeting for Fusarium oxysporum, we're kind of targeting for any fungus and then getting back to see like what's there versus, oh, it's not that, what else could it be? You know, so we're not just like shooting tons of targets at something. We're trying to figure out right out, out of the gate, you know, what is this? And I'm sure at some point we'll have the data, you know, okay, well, most people's plants are affected with these few things, but it's nice to be able to say, you know, we know for sure that it's, you know, okay, oh, it's Fusarium solanari instead of Oxysporum, you know, and well, we didn't have that primer, so we weren't aware, you know, we can be able to kind of identify anything. So, yeah. <laughs> staying busy is what we do <laughs> That's amazing. Biology, trying to keep gardens healthy you know um you know like i have these things that we do but growers always have unique problems you know and a lot of times they just they you know want your advice on what's going on or what they can do to help or you know this is what we're doing and you know i mean even in a lab it's really nice to have you know another person to work through a problem with you because when you talk through something that person's seeing things that you aren't and, you know, in your grow, you know, it's great to have a partner, you know, they see things you don't, you see things they don't, and, you know, you have more covered. And so, you know, a lot of these places, you know, they kind of come in and they'll have certain things and it's like, okay, well, this is great, but what you're doing here is actually, you know, potentially spreading this or the way that you have this ordered or the way that you're looping back from, you know, point C back to point A, you know, and, and pointing that out, you know, is something that maybe everyone doesn't think about. And so, you know, we're, we're constantly kind of working on new solutions for people and unique solutions to different grows, you know, based on their size, you know, what they're trying to accomplish, what their parameters are. You know, some people don't want any babies on site. Some people only clone in house. Everybody has different setups. You have a great job. I do. Yeah, it seems fascinating. <laughs> It's kind of my dream job. Um, I never thought that I'd be able to work in the cannabis space and use my degree and my education, you know, so I feel um, really, really blessed and really lucky and, and happy to, you know, know the people that I do and, you know, people who that I've been able to help, you know, seem to be really happy with everything. And, you know, like, you know, I mean, I, these are people that this is their life, this is their job, you know, and this is my life and my job. So it's nice to be able to do that here. You know, it's exciting. And it's a privilege. Well, it's a privilege to be able to interview you. Is there anything that we didn't touch on here? Anything that you didn't cover that you wanted to cover? 
Um, How do people get a hold of you? How's that? Um, I have a website, deeprootsttc.com. I'm on Instagram, same thing, at deeprootsttc.com. Um, I have a phone number that's on the website. Um, we have a drop-off location um, that's in the back of a commercial store where we keep like all of our dirty material. So that's where we drop all the dirty stuff off to. And then we have a different tissue culture facility where um, you would come if you were you know, dropping off plant material or having a big project or something like that. So lots of ways to get a hold of me. I'm around. I'm like always awake. <laughs> I swear. <laughs> I'm like up all night and then I get up early in the morning. So I hit or miss. But yeah, um, Instagram, website. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. And um, I feel like if you guys um, have like a coupon code or like I can give you guys a coupon code for your listeners, you know, if you mentioned that you, you know, heard about us on the Michigan Rose Grow Show, we'll give you 10% off. There you go. Great. We'll do it. <clears throat> so um, before we get off of here, what we will do is we will invite you back for an upcoming Bro Show Live. And we will have you as a guest panelist and both the panel and the chat will be able to ask questions after watching this. And uh, it's like, I feel like we only scratched the surface of what you have to tell us in a short amount of time. So uh, we really, really appreciate mm -hmm. it. Thank you, Rachel. Okay, cool. Thank you. It was a, thank you for having me. This has been really fun chatting with you guys. It really has.